woke up this morning somewhere in space wondering how I got to this place I couldn't look in the mirror as I couldn't face Look in the eyes that I'd see there So come on, darling, let's put up a fight When we look in the rear view, we see our taillights Tiny afterburners on a burn And we'll be leaving despair tonight The street lamps are reaching up for the sky The whole love is over, there's no reason why That we both won't turn in stars as we drive and float up from all of our kids so come on darling let's put up a fight when we look in the rear view we'll see your tail light Tiny afterburners on a burned out flight And we'll be leaving despair tonight The clock on the wall is fixing its muscles Racing to get to the end You can see your way clear And every way out away from here But you're afraid if you move You might disappear Into the thinness of air Look in the rear view, we'll see your tail lights. Tiny afterburners on a burned out flight. And we'll be leaving the spirit Welcome to the Inside Track. I'm your host, Dwayne Carlton. On this episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the music and songwriting of Laura Molinelli. I grew up in two places. I was born in Tarrytown, New York, um, the lo you know, just above Manhattan. But um, my grandparents lived in Vermont, and so uh, we spent our summers in Vermont, in southern Vermont. I wrote at a very early age, poetry and journals and songs quickly. So, you know, having a rural experience, but also being really close to New York City was also very exciting because um, as I grew, got a little bit older, I had a lot of adventures going into the city and having the freedom and the independence of, of going there and experiencing all the excitement that that had to offer. So I have the best of both worlds, really. My father worked for... BMI, 
which is a uh, licensing, one of the major licensing, music licensing companies in the United States and the world. And um, we always had a lot of music in the house. My father would often bring home um, vinyl recordings from warehouses. I remember going to a warehouse one time when I was very young and just rifling through, you know, boxes and boxes of records and just being able to just take any record. So we grew up listening to a lot of Broadway musicals, classical, jazz. Then I was the youngest of five kids, um, and it was the, the early 70s. So um, I had the wonderful experience of also hearing all the music of my older brothers and my sister, the music of the 60s and the 70s, so in rock and roll. And um, I think probably the biggest influence from my sister and my brother was sort of the alternative country sound of the 70s for Graham Parsons and Emmylou Harris, things like that, even early Eagles. I was very inspired by um, uh, Linda Ronstadt. She was, my, my sister used to listen to her, and Emmylou Harris. And I love the way she sang with such, actually they're two really different kinds of singers. Emmylou Harris is more subtle in her approach, but I was more of a Linda Ronstadt fan because I liked the way she belted her songs. Up till recently, I've been still stealing records from my older brothers and sisters that I found. I was 15, probably. Um, a good friend of mine, Sean Kelly, I, I grew up, I spent my summers in Vermont, as I had said before, and um, we worked together. And he was a huge influence on me because he was, that was what he was all about. And we became very, very good friends. And, and plus I had a little crush on him, so I wanted to learn to play guitar. <laughs> Actually, he introduced me to Neil Young. He's like, you've got to listen to Neil Young. I was like, who's Neil Young? Because I, at the point, I was from New York. I, I was listening to a lot of, um, that was in the 80s, and I was really into listening to punk and new wave and stuff I was hearing on the college radio stations out of New York City. And I wasn't really that interested in country or folk kind of stuff anymore. But I didn't even know who Neil Young was. So, But then he turned out to be a huge influence on me. His music obviously became, you know, it was, oh. I'll have to say that the 80s was my, my that, I'll have to claim the 80s for myself, even though I had all the other influences. And I was very influenced by the electronic and atmospheric sounds that I heard, and I, I liked it. I liked the beats, and um, I liked the whole, like, fashion and everything that went with it, and the, just the, the Greenwich Village scene, and, um, and, like, it seemed passionate to me. Then, of course, there were so many other people like Pat Benatar I loved and Debbie Harry and then I love Stevie Nicks. Fleetwood Mac is one of my favorite bands because of the the male female combination that they had. I thought that was brilliant. And I think now some of the cooler bands I've seen lately, they get that, you know, that cool dynamic of having male and female, not only vocals, but just the whole the whole thing is much I think more interesting. And well this yeah, the people before us were all, you know, into doing cool things for the world and, and, and fighting against injustices. But actually that had a huge influence on me too. And I, I was involved in many things like that still, you know, even through high school and college. And I liked groups like U2 and people that were um, political. But the interesting thing about music today for kids, I think, which I try to explain to my daughter is that, you know, I didn't get to choose really like, they don't have to listen to anything except for what they want to listen to because of Pandora and Spotify and everything is, they can tailor it to what they like. You know, I just listened to what was ever on in my house. I didn't, I didn't have control over the radio or anything. I, there, there was opera playing and I would listen to opera and I like opera, you know, some of it. I wrote my first song in third grade, <laughs> but my first real song was, was, you know, when I got my guitar and I, um, was 15 and then I wrote this song called Inner and Outer Space. <laughs> when you become a teenager and then it's really odd to draw attention to yourself. Music became really, I never thought of playing music for other people. It just became like my way of just talking to myself and working things out and I, I found that very satisfying because I was always a journal writer and I always kept my thoughts, you know, 
written down. And so there was a new way. And then somehow later, I, I kind of thought they were good. You know, I was like, well, maybe I'll try to sing them for other people. You know, and that was a huge step because I was pretty shy. I didn't like to do that kind of thing. I was never in shows or plays or anything like that. I went to uh, the State University of New York in Oswego, New York. And the reason I chose the college is because I like the lake, the beautiful Lake Ontario. <laughs> and I had a great, great time there. I met a lot of cool people. My major was English because I could speak the language. And I could write pretty well. And I liked to read. <laughs> so, yeah, we used to do like peace rallies and things like that. And then and we play. And I, I, I played some of my songs. And then we had the, um, I was in a jug band. The first real band I was in was in college. It was a jug band. And um, we would play, we'd, we would set up outside of this one bar called Old City Hall. It was the cool bar. They used to have great blues bands in there. And then, of course, New York State, and they'd be open really late. And so we would set up outside the courtyard. There was two bars there. And we would set up our jug band. And people would come out, and they'd be, you know, they'd been drinking. So they were feeling good. And we would play for money. They would, like, you know, we'd put out the guitar case. <laughs> it was fun. I moved around a lot. You know, after college, you don't know where you're doing and stuff. But I did have the opportunity to move back to New York City right into the city, whereas before I had lived in the suburbs. And I, I lived down there for three and a half years, um, trying to get into the music scene down there. But it, it was not for me. There is no music scene down there, as far as I'm concerned, because it's, there's too many people. And I find um, we were talking before about creating a scene like where you are. And I realized that that's what it's all about, you know, not trying to join somebody else's scene, but there's plenty of really talented people like right around, you know. But it was a good experience for my songwriting to be living in New York. It was a tough, it was a tough time. It was hard living in New York. It was very, you know, I didn't have a lot of money and um, <laughs> it was quite the growing up experience, but it was good. My family was in Vermont, so I came back here, you know, to kind of regroup and figure out what I was going to do, yeah. Thank you.
I use my personal experiences in my songs for sure. I mean, how can you not? Um, but I don't write purely autobiographical songs. Else, I will like because it's not that interesting. I'm not that interesting a person. <laughs> I want other people to be able to relate to my song. So I never want to be that specific with what I write about or that obvious, you know. And sometimes they'll start out, there's definitely something on my mind or in my heart that's going to inspire me to start writing because that's where it comes from. But then it just, it just becomes this, this thing on its own. Um, the song Are You Out There is definitely a song about something. This, the one song I really wrote that was about my, my father's passing. Um, um, so that was hard losing my dad, of course. It was three years ago, and uh, he was a wonderful person. Um, and um, once again, music came to help me sort out my emotions about it, you know. He, you know, always supported me in, in whatever I, I did, so I was grateful for that. Um, he also was sort of a voice of reason as far as, you know, who to put my trust in. There was a few people that were interested in, in me earlier on that it, it was like the bright lights thing where you're like, oh, you know, that person... So, oh, I'd like to manage you, or I'd like to promote you, or I'd like to work with you. And um, they didn't always turn out to be what they said they were. And, of course, when you want to get your music out there and sort of become famous in that or work in the field and in the industry, when people are coming up to you and saying those kinds of things, it's always very tempting to try to, you know, start working with those people or trusting those people. My dad was very good about... He would go with me. He went with me to several meetings with these people. He said, no, you shouldn't, you know. And I don't know if that was good or bad, but he definitely wanted to make sure I wasn't going to get um, involved with the wrong people. When my dad passed away, I really began to understand that expression, live in the moment, because up to that point, um, you know, nobody that close had died before. I mean, I've, I've lost people in my life, but not as close as my dad. So it was, um, I had to start appreciating each moment, whereas before I was letting them pass by, and I realized life is short. <laughs> so you, you can't be living in the past. You can't be worrying about the future. You really do have to just be where you are and, and be thankful for that. So, I mean, that sounds kind of corny, but it... It's really true. Leave a reminder every single day from the, the song um, Are You Out There is, uh, that is about how, um, well, when people pass away, um, especially someone who lived to be 90, they have a lot of stuff that gets left behind. And my dad was of the generation, the Depression era. He grew up poor in New York and saved everything. And my mom, too, but my dad really badly. <laughs> so he was known to be, you know, quite the collector of just everything and not throw anything away. So after a period of grieving, and um, people in our family began to start cleaning out, and my mom and, and my brothers and my sister and I began to start cleaning out all of his stuff. And um, it was good and healthy to do, but it also upset me because I felt like, well, you know, we're going to get rid of everything, and there's not going to be anything that we can. But there's still there still are things that we we've kept, and I I have his um, dog tags. He was in World War II, and you know we have special things. We didn't need to keep the coupons that were expired in 1976 <laughs> anymore, so I could deal with that. But it was still I was worried. It was getting too clean and too uncluttered, and. I always grew up, my dad always had cluttered workshops and cluttered offices, and that was comfortable and familiar to me. So it, it scared me that all that stuff was going away. But it needed to go away, too, because it was unnecessary. <laughs>
Um, let's see, all I have is a song. I played it all day long. If I have much more, I'll walk right out the door. I think it just creates a cool image. It's like um, a, per a song is a wonderful thing to have, but you can't, you know, it's really not a thing. So um, I think if the idea of, of, of going out into the world, you have to go out with more than just a song. You have to go out with like a plan and some money and, <laughs> and like an idea of what you're going to do, I guess. And, but I'm, I'm happy to sit in my, um, in my kitchen playing my song so I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> I don't know. I, all I have is all I have. I guess it, it's sort of, I'm happy with what I have and I'm, I'm okay with that. So, and I don't know what tomorrow brings either, you know, and I'm not going to worry about it. So I guess the song is hopeful in the end of just you can be content with your world as it is, but it, and you don't really know. It's a mystery of what's coming, and that's kind of exciting and hopeful. And for the most part, whatever we say to people is never what we really want to say. We only say like one, one, one hundredth of what we're trying to say to people sometimes with words. And so if I had, if I could speak, you know, directly from my brain to someone else's brain without words, then I'd really be able to communicate. <laughs> but I have just these, these little symbols I have to use to try to get my point across, so it's a challenge. It's, it's really neat to be able to, like, process your emotions or the world around you and put it into a written form or a visual form as a... As a as an artist or as a, as a songwriter because then once you've done that you can share it, you can use it um, so it's like it's, it's, I feel really lucky or blessed I guess I want to say that I, that I can do that because I feel like that helps me be a better communicator with my fellow human you know and I, that's what I want to do you know. your surroundings affect your songwriting um, yeah, because you're, you're a sponge, you know. 
I mean, the things that are right around you are the things that are really important to you. But those same things are happening to people in a village in Africa, too. So that's the cool thing about it is that, yeah, you write about what you know and, and somebody somewhere across the world will, will still identify that because it's genuine. That helps me, be, I think, helps me become a better songwriter because I'm more open to the world as far as just uh, when I was a teenager and when I'm in my 20s and I'm just really self-centered on my own problems. And you can hear it in the music because the songs are all, you know, obviously really like about me and how sad my life is and so-and-so broke up with me and stuff like that. And now my songs feel so much more um, like universal and open, I think. One of the first big shows I ever played was um, a band I was with early on. We were a Grateful Dead cover band, but we played a lot of uh, original songs too, the Goat Jumpers. And we played at Stratton and we opened up for, um, yeah, the band. I got the opportunity to, to play at the Paramount here, so that was a, that was a, big, a big show, Lou Graham. And, and also, um, and through that, um, I became connected with this promoter who was working with The, the Temptations. So um, he came up to me after the show for Lou Graham, and, we, and he liked the sound that, that I had, so he wanted to work with me. So I, I did some shows with The Temptations, actually. It was fun. I feel really, like, secure about what I do, and I'm not, I just like doing it, and I'm not really trying to impress anyone. I plan to be a very successful musician, um, <laughs> make my living, Playing music, um, I would love to get some. I would love to get into publishing, and and I'd love to be able to to play just really nice venues with people who really want to listen to um, original music. Because um, I'm a working musician, and I play a lot. Um, I play a lot of weddings and parties and events and places where. People want to hear songs they know, and that's cool, and I, I do that, too, and I love that. But, um, you know, I really feel like I want to play places where people are listening to original music, because that's what really gets me going. Thank you for watching the Inside Track. We'd like to thank our guest, Laura Molinelli. Until next time, remember, please support live local music.